The wreck of the Exxon Valdez makes a pretty strong case for requiring future oil tankers to have double hulls and to phase in over the course of several years double bottoms and hulls on the United States oil tanker fleet. Had the Exxon Valdez been equipped with a double hull last March, the Coast Guard estimates that up to 60 percent less oil, about six million gallons, would have polluted Prince William Sound. The Alaska Oil Spill Commission, an independent panel appointed by the governor to investigate last year's spill and come up with ways to make sure another Exxon Valdez never happens again, strongly recommends that the U.S. oil tanker fleet be equipped with double hulls, and the Cooper administration supports that view. A House-passed bill now before the U.S. Senate would require all oil tankers currently operating to have double bottoms within seven years and double hulls within 15 years. Any new tankers would have to be built with double hulls. Meanwhile, more than 117 miles of shoreline stretching from Prince William Sound to Kodiak remain moderately to heavily oiled, much of which will require treatment in the spring. We didn't know what we'd expect to find, but we certainly found a lot of oil in the environment. For instance, when we were taking uh, water samples of interstitial water, we would dig a hole, a pit, and it would fill with, with inter interstitial water, the water that exists between the, the granules of the matrix. When the pit filled, the, the water was black, and when you held up a sample bottle full of this water, it was actually black. So you don't have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to carry out analytical work to show that there's a considerable amount of oil persisting in these sediments. Oil penetration in many areas ranges between six inches to more than two feet deep. Rough winter weather has cleaned the surface of some beaches, but generally subsurface oil doesn't get washed away. Not only are there more than 117 miles of shoreline with oil still on it, but trash and oily debris left behind by summer cleanup crews has been identified at 421 locations in Prince William Sound and the Gulf of Alaska area. This refuse includes fuel dumps, pom-poms, absorbent pads, and various other cleanup equipment. There's little doubt that a cleanup effort will need to resume this summer. To what extent and the type of treatment depends on how much oil remains come spring and how resources like fish producing streams and subsistence foodstuff are affected.
Must be sinking in because here comes.
show the dad. Uh, we've had some really good, uh, the program has worked very, very well. We've been, uh, we've been uh, blessed with some very decent weather for Prince William Sound. I spent a lot of time kayaking out here and I know from personal experience how bad it can get for long periods. So we've been very lucky. Our original goal was to do 25 sites, um, including some controls. And we have at this point, I believe, done 22. So we're right up there where we want it to be. It's, it's been a very successful program and we have uh, hit approximately 20 different sites around Knight Island, Applegate Island, Perry, Green, uh, Smith, um, and uh, Chenega. Um, at all of those sites, we have had intertidal crews working as well as uh, to crews uh, checking the beach profile, comparing it to geomorphological uh, studies that were done earlier, beach assessment, and then we are continuing that work out in the subtital at the four different depths. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like I said before, it's been a very successful program. It's been worth the time and effort. Whether it will show anything remains to be seen. Uh, but certainly having the data from subtitle allows a more complete picture of what the um, effects, if any, on the ecosystem in Prince William Sound from the oil spill and any cleaning techniques. There's a lot of rocks down there today. Small gravel. 
Really? We take four of these. That's a big one. That's a big one. 20 meters. And we got our 10 meter one. And the last one, which is three meters. We keep track of everything on our slates. Random samples we generate each time for 20, 10, 6, and 3 meters. And we take a nutrient sample, water sample at 3 meters for the microbiology. And we sometimes catch fish. And we also take these are for microbiology too. Each one of these sample cups that we use starts out oil-free. It's uh, washed in methylene chloride before we start and then wrapped in aluminum foil so there's no contaminants. So we take these 16 you samples down there. Up a trap.
These guys are not really resident, they're just drift. Now if we don't have a tag just right with the marker on the outside. Sediment sampling begins at 1439 at site number 5, Northwest Bay. Once we finish this, if you want us to, we could go back and we can't work anymore. <laughs> oh. Okay, we'll just try to take it from the same spot again. In the same spot? Yeah, it's best if we try to take it out of Okay. What is it? You get too small of a stone? That's fine. Or leap rock frog team. Yeah, I've got an oil spill uh, right at Entrance Island. It goes probably half a mile by maybe three quarters of a mile. 
looks like it's been run through and split up, but it's it's real big. I'd just say send an overflight crew out here. It's all over the place right near the entrance. There's no wake and no ships around to uh, pin it on. Uh, I take that back. There's a tanker just leaving the Narrows. Uh, I hadn't seen him till now, but uh, he's not leaving any trail. Okay, Chet, real good. Uh, if uh, if you come back through the area later and have anything to report, let me know. I'm going to get in touch uh, get touch with the Coasties and uh, report this, see if they have a way of getting out to it and if they know anything about it. Over. Okay, like I said, it's uh, between Entrance Island and Shoop Bay, and it's it's real big. <laughs>